Yeah, so we discussed the Deutsch algorithm again, which we had already discussed in the beginning of the course. And we saw how the Oracle property would basically be abstracted out to this statement, right? So you have a classical uh, a Boolean function that's given to you, right? And in the case of the Deutsch problem, it's just a Boolean function from a single bit to a single bit, so a single bit Boolean function. But the essence of the quantum oracle is the same, that you construct a unitary which achieves this functionality, right? And we saw that it's possible to do it by simply constructing a unitary which has this property, that if this is the x qubit and the y qubit, this is a controlled unitary which does nothing to the x, but the y essentially becomes oops, y xor f of x, right? Okay, so this is what we discussed last time, and those of you who could not uh, make it to the Saturday class due to other constraints, please go ahead and watch the video lecture. Uh, it has been uploaded and the notes are also there, right? Now the Deutsch Josa problem is just the extension of this to the n bit version. So it's an n bit uh, Boolean function, means it takes as input an n bit string and outputs a single bit string, right? And the task is the same. You are asked to find out whether the function is constant or balanced. Of course, in the n bit case, you can have many more possibilities, but you're given a promise that the function is either constant or balanced, right? Once again, we saw that the thing to do was to construct a, an identical quantum oracle, except that now this x is a state of n qubits, right? Instead of just 0 or 1, this is going to be the computational basis of n qubits. And remember the n qubit space is C2 tensor n, right? I can write down each individual x now in terms of a classical bit string, right? So each x I'm going to write down as x1, x2, x3, etc. up to xn, where each xi can be either 0 or 1. So the all 0 state, for example, will have x1, x2 up to xn all 0. Then the uh, next state, so to speak, in the computational basis will be when all the x's are 0 except xn, which will be 1, and so on and so forth, right? So when I say ket x, it's actually an n qubit state which can be written like this, okay? So the task is clear. You're given an n bit Boolean function. You are assured that the function is either constant or balanced. Constant means all the inputs give you the same output. Balanced means half the inputs give you one output and the other half gives you the other output, which is either zero or one. So you construct this quantum oracle. Then how does this algorithm proceed? That's what we were discussing last time and we left it off here. So I've just copy pasted this from my previous notes, right? I have this uf, which is the oracle function, which does the same, uh, you know, which does whatever this star equation is telling you here, right? And now my data qubits are a set of n qubits, right? These are the so-called data qubits. And this is the ancilla qubit. This is the qubit that's just coming along for a ride. We don't so much care about this ancilla qubit, right? We only care about the data qubits. And these data qubits, as we saw, we have to, so just having this functionality is not enough. We have to query this oracle in superposition, right? So what we do to the data qubits is we are starting first in an all zero state. So let me just write down the steps of the algorithm here. So first, start in the all zero state, which is now zero tensor n is the same as all zeros like this, right? This is the initialization step. And then the next step is to throw this into a uniform superposition of all n bit strings and how many of them are there? There is two to the n of them, right? And as we saw, the way to do this is to use the Hadamard and not just a single Hadamard, but 
an individual Hadamard on each of the n qubits. So this, oops, this is an n qubit Hadamard. H tensor N, right? So that's what the circuit has. It has the H tensor N here, right? It's the all zero state and then the H tensor N. And then you, this feeds into the Oracle. The Oracle now, in the single bit case, the Oracle was a two cross two unitary, right? There was one data qubit and one ancilla qubit. In the N qubit problem, the unitary will be an N plus one cross N plus one unitary where there are n data qubits and one ancillary qubit, right? Okay, so this is the second step. So you do this H tensor n on the zero tensor n, and then this was actually one of the problems of assignment two, if I remember correctly, where you showed that this is true, that if you apply this n qubit Hadamard, to the all zero state, then what you end up with is a uniform superposition of all n bit strings. So when I say sum over x, x basically belongs to 0, 1 cross n, which means it's a set of all n bit strings, right? Another equivalent way to write this would be to say that this is sum over each of these xi's, right? So there is x1 x2, etc., up to xn. Each of these is now a bit, right? So this is sum over these n single bits, x1, x2, etc., xn, okay? I'm deliberately writing it in multiple ways because we will repeatedly do this when we do Fourier transform and so on next, okay? So it's the same thing, right? This, of course, I can again break down into individual sums with tensor products and so on, right? So this is the second step. And then the, what do we do? As we are doing this to the data qubits, we also have to do something to the ancillary qubit. The ancilla qubit gets thrown into the minus state. And this can happen in a two-step process. You use the X gate and make it into a ket one. You use the Hadamard and you make it into a minus state. So the step three, is that this quantum oracle unitary acts on this uniform superposition of all n bit strings of all the computational basis states, right? Remember, it's a uniform superposition. The dimensionality of the space is 2 to the n, so the normalization has to be 1 over square root 2 to the n, right? This tensor ket minus, right? And this is the oracle unitary that's acting here. So this is the third step of the algorithm which is happening here and the state after this is what I denoted as ket capital psi and that's what we were analyzing last time. That's where we stopped actually, right? Okay, so now this, because of the fact that this unitary achieves that uh, the oracle just pulls out a minus one to the f of x, right? We've already seen that in some detail last time. So this then gives me a state which is of the form sum over x minus one to the f of x x minus, right? This is the state capital Psi that we have, but the algorithm doesn't end here, right? This is what has been denoted as capital Psi uh, in the figure. But now you have to somehow extract this information out from the face. And what you want to extract is not the value of each individual f of x, but rather what you want to extract is whether the f of x is constant or balanced which means you somehow have to compare different f of x's, right? You have to compare the outcomes of different f of x using something like an XOR function, right? And then check whether those outcomes are all the same or different. So the way to do this in the single qubit case, if you recall, what did we do here? We applied a single Hadamard. Now we have to apply an n qubit Hadamard and then do measurements, right? And remember, when I draw these measurements, the measurements are always in the 0, 1 basis, unless otherwise stated, right? Okay, so let's look at how this helps. So this is where we were last time. So step four is to do the Hadamard tensor N on psi again, right? And this is a key step 
because in a way this is what helps to compare the different f of x values. So how does it do that? So let's, for example, look at a single Hadamard. Okay. So suppose I have a single Hadamard acting on some x, right? What does this do? If x is 0, this becomes a 0 plus 1 by root 2 and if x is 1, this becomes a 0 minus 1 by root 2. So I can abstract out the action of the Hadamard essentially as follows. So I can write it as a sum over z, okay, minus 1 to the x dot z get z by root 2. So what happens if you expand this out? This becomes, oops, uh, so of course z is again a single bit. So z belongs to 0 or 1. So this means this is minus 1 to the x dot 0, 0, plus minus 1 to the x dot 1, 1 by root 2. And now depending on whether x is 0 or 1, you will either get the ket plus or the ket minus. And this x dot z can be thought of essentially as the Boolean AND operation, right? So this is, if you wish, this is a binary multiplication. Right? So I hope you see that the single Hadamard can, action can be represented like this. So now what do we have? We have a H tensor N essentially acting on something like X1, X2, etc., Xn. So this is going to do exactly the same thing, right? This is, you're going to have a 1 over square root 2 to the N now, uh, right? And then you're going to have minus 1 to the, so if you want to do it uh, each ket by ket, you can even break this down further as h tensor, h tensor, h, acting on ket x1, ket x2, etc., ket xn. So I hope you can see that there is going to now be a sum over different zn's, right? Corresponding to each xi, I will have a zi, right? So this will be sum over z1, z2, etc., zn where each of them belongs to 0, 1. Then I will have a minus 1 to the x1 dot z1, minus 1 to the x2 dot z2, etc., minus 1 to the xn dot zn. I need more space to write this. Uh, move this little bit. Okay, so now I got some space to write this out. Any questions? Yeah. For some reason, this tab doesn't go away today. Ah, good, finally. Yes. All right, let's proceed. So I just gave you some time to digest whatever I was writing. So this is a sum over all the zi's. Each zi is a single bit, okay? And then there is going to be a phase sum like this, which will be x1, z1 plus x2, z2, etc., all the way up to xn, zn, right? And when I write this, of course, it's a binary multiplication here. And then I have ket z1, z2, etc., zn. Okay, so I hope this idea is clear. I have just extrapolated whatever was here to the n qubit case. Okay? Question? Is this step clear? Okay, so now we use this property, right, that the Hadamard on the n qubit state on any, this is a single computational basis state, right? This is going to throw me into a superposition of, again, all possible computational basis states with this phase property. Uh, ma'am? <laughs> yeah. So the state psi also includes ancilla or it is just? Except ancilla. I have included the ancilla here. That's what I did in the figure also. Right? 
Yeah, but it doesn't matter. The ancilla okay. is just coming along for a ride at this point. The main task of the ancilla happened here to get this part. If you recall, this superposition is what led to this minus 1 to the f of x coming out. If this was just ket 0, you will not have this, right? Or if it was just ket 1, you will not have this because it's ket minus that you get a minus 1 to the f of x. So this is where the ancilla played a non trivial role. Right? That here, if you notice, this had to be in a superposition. Right? So, with that, the role of the ancilla is over. Then it's just about these two hadama, uh, understanding the action of these two hadamas, the n qubit hadamas. The first one throws you into this uniform superposition. Then the oracle picks out the phase thanks to the ancilla. Right? The phase has the f of x information. That's the job of the oracle with the ancilla, the superposed ancilla. And now we're just trying to understand what the last Hadama tensor n does. Okay. So this is what it does on a single computational basis state. Okay. And now what does it do therefore to, if I do this on the ket psi, and there is, you can put an additional identity to say that nothing happens to the ancilla. It's just an identity on the ancilla as far as that is concerned. This is going to give me the, there are two square root two to the n, so that can sort of get cancelled out. So you will overall have a one over two to the n. Now remember you have a sum over all x and all z, okay? Because remember this capital psi was a sum over all of these x's. For each x, I now get a sum over z, like this, right? So this becomes sum over x and z. The original capital psi had a minus 1 to the f of x. Now, in addition to that, you have a minus 1 to the x1 dot z1 plus x2 dot z2, etc. plus xn dot zn. And then there is a ket z. Right? And of course, there is a ket minus. So, this is the action of the last Hadamard. I can write this properly as Hadamard tensor n tensor identity, right? So now you have 1 over 2 to the n, sum over all x and z, minus 1 to the, I can simply write this actually as x dot z. So this x dot z is the bitwise inner product, what is called a binary inner product. Right? It's a sequence of AND and OR operations. Right? This is sometimes also called a symplectic product. For those of you who are familiar with that language. But it is basically what I just wrote down. It is simply x1 dot z1 plus x2 dot z2, etc. plus n dot zn. This is binary multiplication and binary addition. Remember that. Okay? Fine. So then you have x dot z um, plus f of x, right? Ket z and ket minus. So now let's get back to the circuit. Remember, this is the state we are having now. We have a superposition essentially of all computational states, right? The z is what this is now, right? Uh, so this is where we are now. Maybe it's a different color for this. Okay. So if you want, you can call this as some psi tilde, right? This is the state after the action of the Hadamards. And that's what we have just written down. Forget the ancilla qubit again. That's just in ket minus. Now this is in a superposition of all the, uh, the superposition of all the Zs right all possible computational basis states but look at the amplitudes now right look at these amplitudes the amplitudes of course there is a 1 over 2 to the n so the modulus is all the same because these are all phases but then there are non trivial phases here right and this phase depends on x and f of x right so this phase information depends on x 
and f of x. So in particular, if I have the all zero string here, actually uh, I don't want to analyze like that. So let's let's just look at the two cases now where uh, f of x is constant or f of x is balanced. Okay. So let me do that. Uh, yeah. So now let's look at the two cases. So let me say that this is the state psi tilde. Okay. So I have two cases here. So let's say f of x is constant. Now, if it's constant, this could either be 0 or 1, right? For all x, for all inputs x, this is also for all inputs x. Uh, if it is 0, then what do you have? So let's look at this. Um, If f of x is 0, then you look at uh, the amplitude of the, write it like this. So, you look at the amplitude of the all 0 string here, right, when z is the all 0 string. I mean, that's the simplest way to analyze this. So, what does that become? There is a overall 1 over 2 to the n, there's a sum over x, minus 1 to the x dot 0. So that's all zero. So all of this becomes one, right? And you're just left with minus one to the f of x. Uh, this is the amplitude. I'm just writing down the amplitude of the all zero string, right? That is, so let me write it fully like, yeah. So this part just becomes zero. So I just have minus one to the f of x. Now minus one to the f of x, if f of x is constant, right? Actually, yeah. So let me discuss it. Then amplitude of the all zero string is like this. So it is simply 1 over 2 to the n, sum over x, oops, minus 1 to the f of x. Now, depending on whether f of x is 0 or 1, this simply becomes plus 1 or minus 1. Do you see this? So the question is, how do we now, from the from measuring these qubits, we should somehow get to know whether the function is constant or balanced. So let us look at the two cases. Let us say f of x is constant. If it is constant, then all the f of x, so the sum over x here, all of them take the identical value, which is either 0 or 1. Then you look at this part. Now this part always has a trivial expression when z is 0, right? When it's the all 0 string. So now you notice that for the all zero string, there is a crucial difference between whether the function is constant or balanced, because this part anyway goes away for the all zero string, right? The x dot z is always zero for the all zero string. But whether f of x is constant or balanced will make a crucial difference. What is that crucial difference? If f of x is constant, then all the phases add constructively. Right? In which case, the amplitude of the the amplitude of the uh, all zero string actually becomes plus or minus one. So the probability then, so if the amplitude probability amplitude is plus or minus one, so what is the probability of getting? the all zero string in the final measurement i hope you're all still with me one no. sorry one. one exactly so the probability of getting the all zero string in the final measurement is one which means your measurement outcome will only be the all zero string if the function is constant is this clear? And now what happens if the function is balanced? Yeah. 
Yes? Can you look at that face that we wrote down and tell me what happens if the function is balanced? The rest of the analysis is the same, except this part. Minus one to the f of x sum over all x. What happens at this in this case? Ma'am, the probability of getting an all zero string will be zero. So we'll get at least one output as one. Exactly. So you can never get the all zero string if the function is balanced. Okay. So that's the main idea here. And that's how a single measurement at the output is going to tell us whether the function is constant or balanced. So let me just complete the argument. If it's balanced, then once again, look at the amplitude of the all zero string. This is again equal to one over two to the n sum over x minus one to the f of x plus x dot z. But of course, this again vanishes this part, right? So what you're left with is once again, simply one over two to the n sum over x minus one to the f of x. But now the faces interfere destructively. Right? Because half of them, half of the f of x are zero and the other half is one. So this is why the promise that the function is constant or balanced is important. If the function was somewhat arbitrary, you can't distinguish a constant and an arbitrary one because there will still be some non-zero amplitude for the all zero string, right? But the fact that exactly half of them are zero and the other half is one, then means that these faces interfere perfectly destructively, right? And this amplitude is actually zero. So then the probability of getting the all zero string is zero. So this is how the algorithm then works. This was, what was this, step four or whatever, right? Step, I don't know, I forget now. Step four, yeah, was the Hadamard tensor n on psi. And then there are two cases, depending on whether the function is constant or balanced. So step five is just the measurement. And this is a measurement in the standard basis. And now you have two possibilities. Either you will get the all zero string with probability one, in which case you know that the function is constant. or you will not get the all zero string, which means you will get one of the other strings, right? One of the other n minus one, oops, sorry, I mean two to the n minus one states, right? So this is one of these, right? With all the way up to all one, right? which means at least one of the measurement outcomes must be one. Remember, it's a classical outcome. So at least one of the, you have n measurements, right? You're measuring n qubits, right? Uh, and each of them can have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. But at least one of them, the classical outcome must be one. Right? And so in that case, f of x is balanced. Okay? And that concludes the algorithm. So you have basically solved the deutsch joseph problem with exactly one query to the oracle, right? And so this is how the quantum algorithm works. With exactly one query to the oracle, you query in superposition using the n-fold Hadamard, you apply the oracle, which based on the ancilla superposition, 
he is going to apply a non-trivial phase and now you have to make the phases interfere and the way to make the phases interfere is using another n-fold Hadamard and then the phases depending on whether they interfere constructively or destructively you either get a constant function or uh, you either get the all zero string output or you get an output which has at least one of the uh, at least one of the locations should be in ket one right which means one of the classical measurement outcomes must be one and then you know that the function is balanced and of course contrast this to the classical case where we need two to the n minus one plus one queries right so this is scaling exponentially with the number of qubits either number of bits or number of qubits which is basically scaling exponentially with the input size right and so the quantum algorithm has an exponential speed up so this is a so called quantum advantage that one sees once with a single uh, bit function it was not so dramatic we went from two queries in the classical case to a single query in the quantum case but now you've gone from a two to the n order two to the n number of queries to a single query right and this is an exponential speed up okay questions i saw some question on the chat uh, if you want you can speak up uh, because i'm going to now move on to the grover search algorithm next is it necessary that the ancilla qubit should be well no it has nothing to do with being orthogonal right uh, it is basically got to do with the fact that it should have a non trivial relative phase that's all if you recall what we did on saturday or maybe i don't know if you were not there on saturday then please look out the video but you see what does this uff do this is the normal functionality what i have drawn in this box here right but now if my ket y is in the minus state that is when there is a relative minus sign between the two outputs between the superposition the, the two states in the output superposition and that relative minus sign is what carries information about f of x okay and that's how you get this star equation you will not get the star equation for example if you just had a plus state right because plus 1 to f of x is not going to help you it's not going to help you mark the value of f of x which is what you want i hope that answers your question uh, sumit sir yeah any other questions okay please work through this calculation if you have not worked it out with me i have tried to go over all the steps of the Deutsch Josa again because the n qubit version is slightly you know more non trivial than just a single qubit version. And in your assignment three, you are asked to do a three qubit, you are asked to do a three qubit Deutsch Josa algorithm, okay. Uh, and you are asked to work out what the oracle matrix should be and implement it on IBM Q, okay. Any questions? Okay, so then let's move on. So the next about 10 lectures or so are all going to be on algorithms only, right? So the Deutsch Josa was the first truly quantum algorithm that was discovered. But you see, the Deutsch problem or the Deutsch Josa problem is basically a toy problem, right? And as far as we know, it doesn't really have any real world applications. So are there real world applications where you can actually see a speed up, right? So the next such algorithm that we will discuss, which is very much a real world algorithm is the quantum search algorithm. And there is an Indian connection here. Uh, this algorithm, which is often called Grover search, right, was discovered by uh, Love Grover, who is an Indian computer scientist at Bell Labs.
Uh, he has in the past visited India for various quantum conferences. Unfortunately, today we are in this super pandemic situation where none of this is possible, but I don't know, maybe he will again visit us sometime and we can all get to meet him and so on. But anyway, this was one of the important real world applications, right? Real world use cases of a quantum algorithm, right? And the search problem, of course, is something that is very easily understood. You have a database with, let's say, capital N entries, right? And typically, we will assume that capital N is of the form 2 to the N or close to 2 to the N, which means you need small n bits or small n qubits to encode this number, right? So you have a database with capital N entries and you have to identify your, the task of your algorithm is to identify a particular entry, right? So you have to identify, and of course it could be one or many uh, solutions. So let me call them. So the task is to identify, let me say, one or more solutions from these n entries. So this is a very abstract statement. Uh, what does one mean by that? So one can look at at least two different examples. The classic one is what is called the traveling salesman problem. So this would be the first example. So the idea is that you have the salesman who has to travel through a bunch of cities. So find the shortest route connecting let's say all the cities in a map. This of course can be abstracted to a graph problem, right? This is also often called the routing problem. And how does the search help you do this? The point is you now search over, so this can be recast as a search, right? So you search through all possible routes and compute their length. This is your objective function which you want to minimize and then you find the route with the shortest length. So this is a broad class of problems again. Uh, there are various, you know, ways of various other applications of this routing or traveling salesman problem. The second kind of example is actually prime factorization. Now prime factorization, of course, there is a whole different algorithm which we will look at starting next week, which is Shor's factoring algorithm. Right? So, of course, you know that finding the prime factors of a given number is a hard problem classically, especially if this is a very big number. But one possible approach to this is to again map it into a search problem, right? Where what you're going to do is search over a whole bunch of numbers, check whether they are factors, right? And then pick the ones which are factors. So you don't know the solution, but you're trying to identify the solution, right? And you're trying to identify solutions using the search problem, right? So for example, uh, find a prime factor. I could make it very simple and just say, find a prime factor of some number m, right? Let me say capital M. But this capital M itself could be the product of two very large primes, okay? 
this is a product of two very large primes. And I often like to give this example because it turns out that my car um, license plate number is a nice number like this. Okay. So let's see if in the next five minutes you can tell me what the prime factors of this are. Okay. So this hardness of this problem is very important in computing and in cryptography because a lot of the cryptographic public cryptography that happens today you know, you securely log into SSH into some server, right? I don't know, many of you are sitting at various places, but you have an S mail and, uh, you know, using your S mail, you log into something and get information and then you log out, right? So all of this happens through what is called public cryptography, right? Because it's not like, you know, IIT is delivering each of you some private uh, information. Uh, through secure private channels. You're all communicating over the internet, the public internet, but there is still a way to do it with some amount of privacy and security, right? And that essentially relies on the hardness of this factorization problem. So this is what is called the RSA crypto system. I'm telling you all this because this will again come up when we do factoring as well, right? But anyway, so when you have a and this is just a four digit number, but today we use, you know, something like uh, uh, like a hundred digit number or something, or actually we take two hundred digit primes, take their product and get, a, get this number, right? So finding the prime factors is very hard. But what you can now do is to search over all numbers. Let's say from two up to, does anybody know if I want to uh, find prime factors of a big number, do I have to search up to what should I search? Okay, somebody factored my car root, license plate number. Root of that number. Correct, exactly. So you have to go all the way up to root n, right? A week, you needed Google to do this for use it. What is this now? I wanted you guys to solve this and tell me. Okay. Um, so you have to search over all numbers from 2 to square root n, right? And then the identifying the solution simply means so you identify a factor, right? That is the same as identifying a solution to the search, right? The factor is the solution to the search, right? But to identify a factor, I simply need to do a simple division operation, right? Which is not computationally hard. So identifying a factor is easy. Okay? Finding a factor is hard. But identifying a factor is easy. Given a number, checking whether it's a factor of this number or not is easy. Right? So I can then recast it as a search problem like this, search over all numbers up to square root n and identify a factor. Now, what the quantum search algorithm does is it speeds up this process. It speeds up the search process. Okay. So already you can see that there is an underlying oracle kind of situation. In the case of the factoring problem, this is like an oracle. Right? This is like an oracle operation because it is marking out the solutions for you. And of course, I picked the number which just has two primes. Right, Such numbers are what are used in these RSA crypto systems, but we, I could have picked some any other number which has like, you know, several prime factors. Right, In which case, there are several valid solutions to the search problem. Right, So this is like an oracle operation because it marks the solution states. Similarly, in the case of the traveling salesman problem, this part, right, which is search through all possible routes and compute their length. This was what the oracle will be doing, right? And then 
you can mark it based on some threshold. You can say that this is as much of a length as I can handle. So if this length is smaller than this length, then you mark it as a solution. And you keep doing this iteratively until you get to the shortest length, right? So these are just various manifestations of the search problem. And this is to show you that several hard problems can be mapped into search problems, right? And what does the quantum algorithm do? The high point is that if I have a database over n entries, so for a database with n entries, which means there are n possible solution states, classically, it takes order n steps or order n queries to identify a solution. Now, what Grover search does, that this can be done in order square root n operations, okay? So this is an example of a quadratic speed up. Unlike the earlier case of the Deutsch Josa where it was an exponential speed up, this is an example of a quadratic speed up and this is what we're going to see over the next two lectures, how this can be done how any search problem can be mapped into a quantum oracle and how invoking this oracle square root n times already leads us to a solution state, okay? So the idea will be the same that you have an oracle. So the basic idea, and I will stop with this because I don't want to start discussing the algorithm today. The basic idea is uh, okay, I should maybe, yeah. Uh, no, I was just going to say that if there are more than one solution, then there is a scaling. Okay, then it takes order square root n over m, where m is the number of solutions. This is if there is a single solution. Let me say with exactly one solution state. Okay, uh, the basic idea is again that there is a quantum oracle and we'll call this some operation O, once again, which acts on your data qubits and an ancilla, which is in some superposition and throws it into this form that it has minus one to the uh, f of x, x, actually you can just say minus one, well, okay, let me do this. So minus one to the f of x, x minus, where now f of x, is basically zero if it is not a solution state, if X is not a solution. Uh, I think that's the convention, let me say, yeah. If X is not a solution and F of X is one, if X is a solution. So this essentially marks the solutions or identifies the solutions. And then once again, we rely on various superposition uh, techniques, right, and interference to show that there is a speed up. Okay, so let me stop here. Questions? Okay, so no further questions, then we'll resume on Thursday. So I think Thursday we can finish discussing Grover search and maybe some remaining analysis we can do on Friday. And next week I'd like to do the factoring algorithm. Okay. All right, so see you all on Thursday. Uh, ben? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. So it, it is just a simple query. I mean, uh, what is the is there any difference between uh, correlation and entanglement? 
correlation can be classical also, right? There is a notion of classical correlation between probability distributions, right? I mean, you have the notion of a joint distribution P of X comma Y, depending on whether this can be factored into P X times P Y or not, you will say that this probability distribution is uncorrelated or correlated. But entanglement tells you that if you write down these probabilities associated with certain quantum states, you have a correlation which is beyond what is possible for just classical probability distribution. And that is what was quantified using something like the Bell's inequality. Right? So entanglement is very much correlation. It is quantum correlation. And the idea of correlation itself, there's nothing quantum about it. Like I said, classical distributions can very much be correlated. Classical random variables can very well be correlated. But an entangled state has a certain correlation beyond what is allowed in these classical theories. Okay? That's the key difference. Yeah. So if I say that uh, two, is two quantum states are correlated, mm -hmm. so does this imply that they are entangled? Well, okay, so people sometimes use it loosely, right? But it is better to always say that they are entangled, right? I'll give you an example. You can have, see, we didn't discuss entanglement in density matrices, for example, right? We didn't discuss mixed state entanglement. So you can have mixed states which are correlated but not entangled, which means there is a classical distribution through which you can realize the state and that distribution could have some correlation, but these states are really not entangled in the quantum sense. So that's a very fine distinction, but typically if people say quantum states are correlated, usually they mean they are entangled, right? They fused somewhat loosely. Mm -hmm. It depends on the context, I would say, yeah. Thank you. Okay, see you all on Thursday morning.